little tiny, tiny plug from the Connecticut Poetry Society. I have brochures on my table that just tells you all what we do and all the free things you get. <laughs> Sometimes, even if you're not a member, we, we do a lot of free things for the public, too. So, um, All right, so does everyone know what ekphrastic poetry is? No. no. Oh, you're in for a treat. <laughs> so, uh, so ekphrastic poetry, I'm going to shorten this a little bit just in the interest of time. So ekphrastic poetry is poetry that's inspired by a work of art. So, for example, there's a painting on the wall, and you look at it, and you look at it, and what does it say to you? How do you react to that painting? And um, the first page, I, I'm not going to read this word for word. This is for you to take home forever and ever. And um, there is a quote on page one. It says, there is no picture and no poem unless you enter it and fill it out. And that's a very, uh, very interesting statement. We could talk about that if we had the time. But, uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to read the, a poem on page two before I start the slides. And then, uh, then I'll ask someone else to read the poem on page three. So, all right, so here it is. Um, the poem is titled Detail. You're the kind who looks at a painting and wonders what's happening beyond the stretched canvas, where it wraps around the wood frame as if it were a detail from a larger work, or like a photograph, one small scene inside a wider one curated by the eye. You wonder what's beyond the bowl of fruit, beyond the gray sea with its meal of wrecked ships, beyond the mother holding her burning red-cheeked child. You're the kind who thinks there must be more than this, more than what you can see. The kitchen might be filling with bees, drawn buzzing to the bowl of red and yellow apples, and the waves the waves might be ruffling, white, and folding over on themselves, breaking, breaking, like a fever. So, you are the kind who is going to look at a painting and see what's beyond, because we're going to write a little bit. So, um, I, I chose a, a painting that you're all familiar with, uh, Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. And so this, I, I just love the way this poet, Honor Mormon, uh, wrote about it. Uh, and she was thinking of Van Gogh, what he was feeling as he was painting. So would anyone like to volunteer to read this? You have a wonderfully loud voice. Sure! <laughs> I'm going to volunteer you. Sure. <laughs> OK. Um, staring at the night after Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. Perhaps he too once stood just here, head tilted, eyes licking, the orangey crescent moon, exploding stars, flaming cypress, swirling silver sky. His imagination suspended in the silent city, beneath quaking black mountains, secret recesses of a tender growing night. Van Gogh whispering to his soul with furious brush strokes, as I cannot, with this trickle of words, he will never read. Okay. All right, so that's one way to respond to a painting. Um, all right, so, okay, that's good. I did happy accident. Uh, so we're going to talk about acrostic poetry, and we're going to focus on one specific uh, painting. Um, but, before we do that, I just want to tell you a little bit about my art background. I have an MS in art, art education mm. uh, with a minor in art history, so I love everything art and poetry related. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And so ekphrasis is a very exciting topic for me. I believe, like I said in one of my panels, is that the artists and poets are the true historians. Woo. And you'll see how that unfolds. 
especially as we talk about at crisis and study Alvin's uh, Musée des Beaux Arts. It's, it's a perfect example of the power of, of art and poetry together. And his poem is based on Google's painting Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And I have in my notes here to show paintings, to show slide five. Um, uh, let's see if I can. Okay, so that's so that's the painting that the poem is written about. So um So uh, you'll see how uh, the arts inspire, if not to take one another's place, at least reciprocally to lend one another new powers. And a phrase can be any art form. It doesn't have to be uh, a painting. It could be a uh, poem inspired by music, dance, um, sculpture, whatever. And, and the poems themselves are artworks as well. So. Um, I am going to go along to pay to slide five. Okay, so this is just a little bit about the history of Ekphrasis, and I think that's in your packet that I gave you. Um, it was it was originally taught to the big students, um, and the challenge was to bring the experience of a person, a place, or a thing to an audience. And the true use was not to simply provide details of an object, but to share the emotional experience. And I think that's a lot of what we were talking about in the panels. Um, so the student of Ekphrasis was encouraged to lend their attention not only to the qualities immediately available in an object or an artwork, but to make efforts to embody qualities beyond the physical aspects of the work. And I think that goes back to um, not just describing the painting, but um, describing the reaction to it. Okay. Right. So um, in doing my research for this presentation, um, it, it's led me to all kinds of interesting people and ideas. So first, I'd like to have a little fun with you. I don't know if you've all heard of the, of the Getty Museum challenge to recreate yes. famous <laughs> paintings. I know. Oh, you're going to love it. <laughs> so, um, so it challenges people to recreate famous paintings using items around their house. Cool. Okay. And and themselves. So let's see how creativity works. You're just going to be blown away by this. So. Um, so, oh my god! Oh, so I love it. I love it. Gusto Klimt's The Kiss, and there it is recreated. That's so beautiful. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Yes! Oh, it really went into it. Oh, that's not great. Uh -huh. I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to ask poets to, to do, get together and do this for one of our uh, Connecticut Poetry Society events. Ooh. Yeah. You know, and then have like judging and have a contest. Um, and this is... Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, aren't these bizarre? They're fabulous. They Absolutely are. fabulous. Picasso, wow. girl, be Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. American Gothic. Yeah. I guess it's American COVID. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's right. So uh, I hope you enjoyed those as much as I did. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I go online and I just keep looking mm -hmm. at them and looking for more. So um, the poem is by W.H. Auden, and he was an English poet born in 1907, and he was a major influence on poetry in the 20, 20th century. Um, he, he was known for his extraordinary intellect and wit. And just before World War II broke out, he emigrated to the United States, and he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1948 for the age of anxiety. So that is happening right there. All right, so we're going to look at 
write two poems about the same painting. One is by Audi and the other is by William Carlos Williams. You may, you may all be familiar with William Carlos Williams. Um, he wrote very short poems and his line breaks were instrumental. So uh, I actually I actually think I'm organized. All right, so this is the poem by William Carlos Williams, and I did give you a copy of the painting in your um, handout, just so when it's not on screen. So, um, all right, according to Bruegel, when Icarus fell, it was spring. A farmer was plowing his field. The whole pageantry of the year was awake, tingling near the edge of the sea, concerned with itself, sweating in the sun that melted the wings lax. Unsignificantly, unsignificantly off the coast, there was a splash, quite unnoticed. This was Icarus drowning. So you'll see that his poem is very different from Auden's poem, which we're going to look at next. Okay. Um, would anyone like to read this? Musée des Beaux-Arts. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position how it takes place while someone else is eating, or opening a window, or just walking dully along. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, <laughs> skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course, anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. Mm. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to, and <laughs> sailed calmly on. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely read. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's quite an interesting poem. So there we have the painting again. Okay, and the painting is titled uh, "Landscape with the Fall of Icarus." Okay. So where where is Icarus? Is that his legs in front of the ship? Yeah. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> Way in the corner, um, barely visible, because we're looking at everything else, and there's poor Icarus there. Not even the focal point. Not even the focal point, although he is the focal point of the poem, because his name is in the title. Um, so. So, Adam plays with the possibility of Icarus going unnoticed, um, but he delves deeper into that, into the why of it. Um, and the painting um, ha is about a fraught relation between attention and disaster. So, in other mm -hmm. words, something's only a disaster if we notice it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's the poet's job to notice. Like we were saying before, or you were saying before, absolutely. Everybody else is going about their business, not noticing, but the painter and the poet are both saying landscape with Icarus. Yes. Like, so they're pointing out that to everyone else is just an unremarkable dog. And you all know who Icarus 
was, right? His father fashioned him with a pair of wings out of wax. He told Icarus not to fly too close to the sun. And of course, you know, like every other child, Icarus didn't listen, and the wax melted, and there he is. Um, but isn't it kind of funny? Um, you know, he's so close to the shore. Maybe if he just stood up, he would have drowned. Mm. Stood up. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. So, uh, so, um, so this, uh, this is a slide of, of the Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Brussels, and, um, Alvin, Alvin spent a lot of time um, in, in this museum, in the rooms, rooms just like this. Uh, and I think that's kind of, you know, he's thinking about world events, and I think that's what really inspired him um, to write about that painting. Um, and what I have done here is, uh, I've color coded the lines for you so that when, uh, so when I talk about a specific um, thing, I'll say, okay, refer to the red, to the lines in red, um, and then it'll make sense. Uh, so the poem begins with a grand pronouncement. Uh, a, a sweeping and unapologetic unapologetic um, generalization about art and humanity. Um, so about suffering. So the poem is about suffering. Um, and how well they understood, this is talking about the old masters, um, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully And then he offers some examples of the commonplace nature of the catastrophe. He describes scenes from biblical history as one of the old masters might have rendered them. So um, while the old await Jesus' birth, the young are off having fun. So that is in the blue. Um, how when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. <laughs> so the literal perspective um, is, is metaphorical. Um, no one thing in particular uh, pulls your eye. But, uh, So let's read, let's read the lines in orange. They never forget that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course. And who is the they? Who are they talking about? Still back to the old masters. Still so back to the old masters. And anyhow, in a quarter corner, some untidy spot, where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. <laughs> so the, these are just mundane things that are going on. Uh, and so the old masters knew that even legendary trials and tribulations could look trivial from a certain uh, perspective. Jack, I was just thinking about <clears throat> how this first stanza is so relatable. It reminds me when I was uh, 19 and I was living in Germany at the time and my grandparents were in Pennsylvania and my grandfather died and everybody was outside, which where we lived never happened because it's always freezing, but this one day, it was, you know, in the mid-70s, and 
everyone was outside and sunbathing and laughing. And I can remember looking out my window and saying, how could they be having fun? Don't they know Pop Guy? You know, and, and you know, I, I, well, I was 20 at that time. You know, but so when, when we look at this, it's like, yeah, people just go on with their lives. Um, uh, not knowing or not wanting to know. I think that's like one of the great distinctions between the Auden piece and the Williams piece. Um, you know, Williams seems to want to say, perhaps people didn't see, perhaps this went unnoticed. Right. But Auden is like, no, they turned away. They knew exactly <laughs> what was going on. And this person had this to do, and this person had that to do. And so I find Alden's poem more an indictment of, of who we are. Right. <laughs> yeah, which seems so timely considering right. the news cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Poems are never, they never go out of style. They're always relevant. And I was thinking, too, that, you know, this, this applies to our modern day world and happenings in the country, in the world, uh, don't we just kind of say, oh, that happened, you know, and then we go about our daily lives as if it's no catastrophe. But there are catastrophes happening, big, big ones. And, and here, we, here we are, um, just like the people in the painting. So, um, so something's only a disaster if we notice it or if we care about it. Yes, and maybe a poet can help bring people's attention to it sometimes, exactly. help them to care about it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, okay, it, you're not noticing this, so, you know, it didn't happen, it doesn't matter. So, mm -hmm. like, oh, if a, tree, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one right. yeah. there, it doesn't still make a sound. So, it's mm -hmm. kind of that type of thing. Well, they all hear the vibration. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so everything is turning away from the disaster. The plumman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. Mm -hmm. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing. A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to go and sailed calmly on. And that's the way we do it. And so there's such an important uh, lesson in this, and you know, just the fact that um, the, the painting is about the details that hide in plain sight. And if you didn't know the title, you might not know the stickers at all. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Let's talk a little bit. I don't think I need to. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the craft of the painting. Um, it's a writing poem, but it's not obvious. And those are the best kind of kind of things. The shaggy line lengths and the heavy enjambment, and it helps disguise the end line. You'll see that. And, and so the rhymes are hidden. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. The rhymes are hidden, too. Oh, it's like Icarus. It's hidden. Ah. Yeah. Ah. So it asks us to question our place in the world and to ask what we, we might be missing. Um, it, and also, so is the father, Diagonalus, is he innocent? I mean, he, he's the one who made the wings, right? Uh, so whose folly should we scorn more, the father or Icarus? So it really, it really generates a lot of questions. Um, it's, it's a great poem for conversation. Um, so, and, and there is just a feeling of reluctant acceptance in the poem's final lines. Um, do, we spare, do we spare thought for the suffering? Or do we just sail calmly on? Mm -hmm. So that's the question it demands of us. Um, so uh, 
Yeah, so it, it, you know, the message seems simple enough, but if you, um, if you go back to the painting, you can see, you know, um, if, if you were like the farmer looking down, um, not looking at the edges, you might miss the most important part of the painting. Um, and Auden reminds us that edges are a part of the picture. Ignoring them is the most natural thing in the world, and it's also a moral error. Um, and this, again, this is where I see it relating so much to what's going on in our world today. Um, you know, compare the last lines to our disinterest or apathy um, to others' suffering, as long as it's not our own. Um, and, you know, again, to current events in our time, Ukraine, um, Puerto Rico, the floods, fires, hurricanes, shootings, uh, and the myriad of other other problems that we can talk about. But, um, and, you know, humans, they, I'm going to go back to the poem. So humans um, tend to consider incidents on a chronological plane, yesterday, today, and the future. But this poem, it tilts our temporal awareness from a vertical to a horizontal axis, and it forces us to ask the difficult but empathetic question, while I'm living and breathing now, is someone else struggling and dying at this very same moment elsewhere in the world? So, very, very thought-provoking. Um, we are going to do a little bit of writing, so I'd just like to talk for one minute about um, about weeping poetry, making leaps in poetry, because um, if you read uh, or have read Robert Wise's Le Le book, Weeping Poetry, he says that great works of art contain leaps within themselves, as we saw here. Um, and there's a huge leap in how did that painting inspire that poem? So if you think of the poems we read, you know, in our little packet too in the beginning, how did that painting inspire that poem? So the poet makes use of that association tool. He leaps from the external to the internal. And um, that moment when the poet makes an unseen association. And we can do it with music. Um, we can do it with any of the arts. Um, and I'll, I'll just read a quote, quote here. It says, in the act of seeing, the mind of the poet can wander to unexpected places, rendering the writing new, stranger, and sometimes more surprising. You are not just describing the painting, what you are seeing. Go far afield and take a leap. And in ancient times, the poet flew from one world to another. So, I'm going to have you do a little writing right now. There's a, there's a painting by Marc Chagall, and it's titled The Three Candles. Um, just, just look at it for about 30 seconds. And where's the title? The Three Candles. So what do you see? What do you feel? when you look at that painting. What does it inspire in you? What, what kind of thoughts are you having? How do you relate to it? Ah, so many questions. On your packet, you will see, and I think it's, yeah, it's, it's on the same page, yay, okay. So, um, so you're going to study the painting carefully, note colors, shapes, images, mood. Mood is very, very important, um, and tone in your poems. Um, and maybe just do a free write. Uh, describe what you see. Uh, concrete details, simile, is there a metaphor in there somewhere? Um, write several questions that are raised by the painting. But don't try to answer them, just explore them. And 
I don't need to read every one of, the, of these because it is, it is printed out for you, but um, I am going to go back to the painting. I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to do some writing. And, and let's see what you come up with. You can, you can just write for yourself, or you could write for the audience. You can share or not share. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. Um, but I just want you to... I'll stop talking so you can... <laughs> uh, would anyone like to share? Tom, I bet you do. Okay. <laughs> what is more important here? The white of the flowers in the trees? The white of the bride's dress? Mm -hmm. Or the red of the carpet upon yeah. which they walk? Or is it a flying carpet carrying both lovers softly to the brown earth? And all around are small figures. And are those fairies in the trees flying so smoothly? And what are those figures in the foreground? More of the little people or just toys welcoming the happy couple? But then here are the candles enshrined by the title of the painting. They, they must have prominence, no? And look how differently colored they are. Who with them, surely some magic is at play here. Or is it the magic of the love of the couple? Sure. Um, I focused really specifically on one part of the painting. So it was so cool to hear Tom's kind of really, in a, in a way, taking a lot of things in. So I think this is going to be a big contrast to that. <laughs> Anyways, never had a man's hand held flat on my chest to make a print or be a restraint? Is it protection or just short of a strangle saying, do not speak? And then the seeming tenderness of the other hand, arm around the back of neck, on head pushed down as if she were the human form of a bird kept from flying. Hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you, you both wrote those in five minutes? <laughs> Do we have another brave soul? Okay. Go ahead. Jack. Something in the flames, orange, green, yellow, frightened my bride, threatened my bride. And I hauled her back, protect her from white smoky puffs as clowns and angels cavort in air 
A blue donkey crouches near the flames, and houses cling tenaciously to hillsides. Blow out the candles. Leave my bride to be. Leave her to me. I, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Yeah. And it got you thinking a little bit and uh, writing some acrostic poetry. And um, I just want to say thank you to Sandy and Ed for inviting me here today. It's, it's such a such a pleasure to get to meet all of you and, and uh, share. Share. Thank you. Thank you so much.